Good evening. I'm Alice Carlson of the League of Women Voters of Coos County. Welcome to all our viewers to this debate, which is for the candidates for state senate. I want to thank all of the committee members and volunteers who helped make this forum possible. Special thanks goes to Paula Bechtold, a league member who is our moderator this evening, and to Marshfield High School for use of the facility and for filming this debate. The Coos County League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, and our mission is to encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government to increase the understanding of major public policy issues and to influence public policy through education and advocacy. The League takes political action on issues on which members have studied and reached agreement. Action positions can be developed at the national, the state, or the local level. The League never supports or opposes any political party or any candidate for elective office. The League has developed a fair process for this forum. The rules have been agreed upon by the candidates in advance of this debate. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones or place them on vibrate. Our moderator will now introduce the candidates. It's my pleasure to be here tonight to moderate the debate between the candidates for Oregon Senate District 5, and I am going to not introduce the candidates, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I am going to read the rules for tonight's debate. Each candidate will have two minutes for introductory remarks. Then we have questions that have been submitted from the public to the League of Women Voters, which have, will be asked of the candidates. Each candidate actually received a specific question, and those will be answered first. The candidate to whom the question was directed will have one minute to respond. The opposing candidate will have 30 seconds to respond. The other questions have been not specified for any particular candidate, so the candidates will take turns going first but each will have one minute to answer the question. And the candidate that is first asked the question will have 30 seconds for a rebuttal after the opponent has had their one minute. So in other words, it will be each candidate will be asked a question, will have one minute to respond, the other candidate will have one minute to respond, and the first candidate asked the question will have 30 seconds to respond to whatever their opponent may have said. And I think it will make sense as we go along. At the end of the debate, each candidate will have two minutes for closing remarks to clarify and summarize their positions and goals. And thank you both for being willing to participate tonight. So the first question, or the, the first candidate alphabetically um, to address you in two minutes is Mayor Anderson. Thank you. Thank you to the League and uh, good evening. I am Dick Anderson and I'm prepared to be your state senator from the coast. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm very disappointed in our political uh, climate here in the state of Oregon. I'm wondering what's happened to our elected uh, officials, individuals, uh, why they no longer sit down and talk, debate, discuss, vote, and regardless of the outcome of that vote, agree with respect to move on to the next pending issue that's in front of citizens of Oregon. Our legislature is out of balance, and it's been out of balance for a decade or more. We like to think and assume that our legislators have uh, actually been discussing and uh, open mutual respect for each other, but with a supermajority, that doesn't happen, and it hasn't happened in this state. 
One of the reasons why I've chosen to run for Senate is to actually break this supermajority. Your vote for me, a Republican, won't change the control of the Senate chamber. But what it will do is force the discussion in order to get one Republican to actually vote for a tax of, to all of us. When you think about that, that opens and, and causes the discussion that's so needed for the legislature to really do its best work. And really, wouldn't that be the best for all of us? Thank you. Good evening. Thank you so much to the League for putting on this forum. It has been incredibly difficult for candidates to have an opportunity to talk to each other and to talk to the voters during this pandemic. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all tonight and to see Mayor Anderson in person because he and I have had a hard time actually being in the same space together due to the pandemic. So it's always nice. Um, for many of you, I am currently your Coos County Commissioner and I have been for the last eight years. I've appreciated the opportunity to represent you both in Coquille at the courthouse, but also in Salem and in Washington, D.C. It's been my pleasure and my honor to bring the voice of the South Coast to many important conversations and to stand up on the issues that you are truly concerned about. As a Coos County Commissioner, I have been able to testify on issues such as um, building a 100% clean economy and the challenges that that faces with rural um, communities as well as the more common issues that you're all aware of like cap and trade um, and the challenges of potentially changing diesel emissions and all of those I have spoken up strongly for the difficult impacts that that would create for our coastal economies because we all know that when there is an economic recession we're hit harder and we stay in that recession longer than the valley and the metro area. As a county commissioner and as your next state senator, my top three priorities are economic development, um, supporting our community colleges, and lowering the cost um, and increasing access to health care. I'm honored to have been endorsed by a great many groups, including the State Police Officers Association, the Barrier Chamber of Commerce, the Nurses Association, the Firefighters Council, and county commissioners and mayors across the board. I'm also nominated by the Independent Party and the Democratic Party. Thank you so much. And as I mentioned at the opening, each the public was invited to submit questions to each candidate or all candidates. And there, were, there was one question submitted specifically addressed to Commissioner Cribbins. She will have one minute to respond to the question, and then Mayor Anderson will have 30 seconds to respond to her response. Commissioner Cribbins, please explain why taxpayer funds were spent on out-of-county travel. Thank you so much. When I first ran for county commissioner, my statement was that our voice should be in all the places where decisions are being made. We all know that the decisions that impact people in Coos County aren't made in Coos County. They're made in Salem and Washington, D.C. As such, I asked my fellow county commissioners right off the bat to please make me their National Association of Counties representative and their AOC representative because we can't afford for all three commissioners to attend these meetings. They agreed and they have told me repeatedly that they've been happy with my work on that. I don't get to decide where those meetings are held. And unfortunately, sometimes, many times, that means I have to leave Coos County. It's only been during the pandemic that the state legislature has been willing to take remote testimony. So it's been my honor and my distinct privilege to make sure that your voice is being heard in those places where decisions are being made. I have testified on a great many issues, and I look forward to continuing to work on a great many issues for you. Thanks. No, I think that's um, very admirable of the commissioner. Um, one of the things that I do as mayor is take a, a look at what our economy, what our expenses are in the city, and judge the trips or conferences that I attend based on the availability of funds. 
And all I would ask is the county, uh, Coos County taxpayers just evaluate their own, make their own judgments on how much travel and the expense that travel uh, does take to uh, justify these trips. And the second question from the public was specifically addressed to Mayor Anderson. So again, Mayor Anderson will have one minute to respond to the question, and then Commissioner Cribbins will have 30 seconds to respond to his answer if she chooses. Mayor Anderson, please speak to the allegation that you held meetings in potential violation of the open meetings law. Thank you, that's a, a good question. And uh, on, I would encourage uh, anyone to look at the uh, validation of this information because one, this was a complaint filed by a uh, would-be uh, media person who wanted to attend an executive session by the city and didn't go through the process of getting appropriately approved as a media person. Um, I wasn't mayor at the time. I was on city council. The whole council and mayor was actually uh, the complaint filed uh, against the whole council and mayor. So it wasn't me holding a meeting. It was a prior mayor. And uh, it turns out that the media person uh, finally had to come through and actually do and get credited to, in order to attend an executive session. Thank you. Mr. Cribbins, any response? I think that it is critical and the public expects us to engage in transparency to the fullest extent under the law. As elected officials, it's important that we hold ourselves to that standard. And, um, and I think it has been a difficult time with these new uh, types of media. You know, it used to be that it was all newspaper reporters and we knew exactly who the media was. Um, and now with the media changing and being in different formats, every city and county has to reevaluate constantly what, can, what constitutes the media and respond accordingly. We will now move to the general questions that were submitted by the public for both candidates to answer. And the process is that whoever, and we, you'll alternate, we're going to play totally fair. Whoever gets the question first will have one minute to respond. The other candidate will have one minute to respond. And the candidate that was first asked the question will have an additional 30 seconds if he or she chooses to respond to anything that his or her opponent may have brought up in their response. So the first question will be addressed to Commissioner Cribbins. Ethics or lack thereof in government is front and center. Discuss the relationship legislators should have with lobbyists. I think legislators should have the same relationship with lobbyists that they have with any citizen. We should, my door has always been open. And anybody who's ever tried to contact me as a commissioner can tell you that I'm always open to talking to people. Um, I realize that for some people, Coquilla is actually a long ways away. Um, 20 miles, if you don't have transportation or an easy way to get there, can be an insurmountable barrier. So I'm always happy to meet people in Coos Bay or North Bend or Myrtle Point if that's where it's more, a place that's more convenient for them. Um, and so I have always had an open door to all of my citizens. And I feel the same way about lobbyists. If they need to come talk about something, because they do represent a certain group, I'm happy to talk about it. But I don't give it any more deference than I would for anyone who wants to come and talk to me about an issue. I think it's important that we keep an open mind. And it's important as legislators that we get as much information as possible before we make a decision. Because it's our job to carefully consider the facts before we make a decision. Thank you. Yes, uh, lobbyists are certainly uh, paid professionals uh, to represent a group. Um, but uh, they, they are no different than a direct citizen or a member of an organization. And uh, that same relationship should exist with, with both. 
I think uh, we have already existing laws and uh, rules that uh, apply to you know, uh, meals and expenses and thus related with uh, anyone, a citizen or a lobbyist. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the whole idea of, um, you know, a concern there is uh, not unfounded, but well regulated and needs to be enforced. And um, I, I talk to everyone, I look for uh, experts in a field to give me pros and cons about an issue. Thank you. Quickly, I think I'll say that um, I think it, it begs the bigger issue of campaign finance reform in the state of Oregon. The amount of money that it takes to engage in a large campaign in the state of Oregon is beyond the average person's comprehension. Um, and we really need to look hard at campaign finance reform in the next year and make some serious efforts that direction. Mayor Anderson, do you support the corporate activity tax? Why or why not? The corporate activity tax, or some call it the uh, Oregon sales tax, um, is certainly um, well-founded as far as a source of funds for the right reason, for education. I don't think this was the right f source of the funding. I think it's, uh, it, it is not a good tax to um, charge tax a gross revenue um, is just unfounding for me. I've talked to enough people during this uh, last few, well, this year that has been in place that are actually not making any money into the tax and will be paying a tax even though they've operated their business in the red. And that just seems you know, unforgivable. I think that you know this brings up an important issue that we need to talk about and there are a couple of things that we need to fix in, st in the state of Oregon and one is school funding um, school funding when I graduated from high school in 1990 schools were pretty well funded I felt like I got just as good of an education in Coquille as I would have gotten anywhere in the state and many of my classmates have gone on to become doctors and lawyers and make a very good living for themselves Schools aren't that way anymore. My son has had to share textbooks. And it seems ridiculous to me that we are asking children in this day and age to share textbooks. We need to look at the bigger issue in Oregon of tax reform generally, because it's not fair and it's not equitable. And people who make less money are frankly paying a larger share than they should have to. We really need to take a holistic look at tax reform and figure out how we can tax the things that we care about in the state of Oregon because we all care about our children and want to see them taken care of. Any response? No response. I agree with the commissioner. All right. Commissioner Cribbins, what methods would you propose for lowering greenhouse and methane emissions, saving our oceans from further acidification, and investing in a clean energy economy? So I believe in climate change. I think we should get that off the table right away. Um, but I did not support the cap and trade um, bill. And that was because I didn't feel like it actually would make a difference in climate change or a difference for the people that are most affected by it. So many of our citizens are living right at a subsistence level. And if we are going to put a greater burden on them, we need to be able to explain where the benefit is at. And we need to be able to tell them how it will make their life better and not just have it be an additional tax. Frankly, I am in favor of, you know, it, the state of Oregon is a tiny, tiny contributor to greenhouse gases. Any bill that we look at hard for greenhouse gases needs to be at a federal level. And it needs to go across state lines because just trying to do something in the state of Oregon is just a drop in the bucket. And yes, uh, I too, um, I'm a firm believer that uh, humans have had an impact on our global warming, and it is a serious issue and something that needs to be uh, confronted, but uh, on a federal level, on a global level. 
And I'd just like to remind uh, us all of some of the things that Oregon already has done and is doing to keep the emissions down. And it's from the low carbon fuel standard, the renewable portable standard, the coal to clean, the Energy Trust of Oregon, the clean fuel law, the tax benefits for solar, tax benefits for wind, BETC, electric car subsidies, monitoring offshore drilling. Uh, drilling. So, you know, I'm, I think we've done a lot. We need to let these things settle in and have uh, more influence and uh, advocation for a global impact um, to where it's really uh, the pollutants are. Anything further, Commissioner? Um, I just want to thank the mayor for calling out the Energy Trust of Oregon because I'm the board president and we really think we do great work, so I appreciate him recognizing us for that. Thank you. Mayor, would you support expanding resources for mental health and social needs as well as improved training for public safety officers? Well, that's a mouthful of a question. Um, certainly, I, I would. The, the audience doesn't recognize that the Oregon is on the bottom of the list of mental health um, access. And, you know, that's the, in my opinion, a root of many of our issues that we face as social issues. And uh, I think we need to put a lot more resources to um, that access for assistance and, and help. As far as, you know, we all need to be trained. Um, I'm a firm believer that whether it's our law enforcement, first responders, um, mayors, commissioners, we all deal with people and need to better understand um, the signals, the, the things that are getting in the way and uh, how best to, to deal with these kind of situations. Um, I absolutely support more funding for mental health resources. Um, I am the liaison to Coos Health and Wellness, and it's a constant struggle to be able to provide enough services for the number of people that need them. I've found that our public safety officers are thrilled to have any additional tools that they can get in order to deal with people that are in mental health crisis. Um, I talk to many of them and they tell me one of the most frustrating things that they deal with is having to go out on a call for somebody who's clearly in a mental health crisis and not having the tools to help them. If you don't have a place in the community to take somebody to, the last place you want to take somebody to who's in a mental health crisis is the jail. It's not going to make it any better and frankly it just causes problems in the jail. We really need to find a way and find resources for people that are suffering from mental health crisis um, because we don't have enough now. I might point out again to our listeners that uh, in Lincoln City, uh, the city itself under my leadership has actually taken a stance on our own and have funded uh, transitional housing in Lincoln City. Uh, should house anywhere from 30 to 40 people. Um, these are people with uh, addictions and mental health issues and not only the counseling, but we're including housing with that to make sure that they're uh, properly on their meds, understand their issue, and can get back into society. Commissioner Cribbins, will you promise to attend when the legislature is in session, no matter what is being debated and voted on any particular day? Why or why not? Should there be a penalty for legislators who fail to show up to work? Yes, I will promise to attend no matter what. Um, I am a county commissioner and we run nonpartisan, but I have been in the political minority for eight years now. And I have showed up no matter what, even on votes that I you know, knew I was going to be on the losing side of. I know it's hard. And I know it's not a position that anybody wants to be in, but you, what you do is you build relationships and you work across the aisle and you find compromise. And I believe it makes for better legislation by doing that. Um, I appreciate my fellow county commissioners. We have a great working relationship and we have built that through a culture of mutual trust and respect and collegiality. 
and it hasn't been easy. And it, it took a little while for us to find, to find our place. But we, um, we really have that now. And yes, I do believe there should be a penalty for legislators who don't show up for work. Um, it's, a, it's a job. You should go. Thank you for the question. I, I find it uh, interesting because I too am a uh, nonpartisan elected mayor and deal with city council members, uh, six others who are all nonpartisan, and come with all different walks of life and, and uh, passions. We've found ways to work by uh, discussing and talking and sharing. And that's what doesn't happen when there's a supermajority. So, you know what? answer really is uh, electing me a Republican to the Senate, uh, there'd be no reason for a walkout because it forces discussion. And that's really what is needed. Um, I don't mind a penalty. Uh, I think uh, if, if that seems to uh, satisfy the need, but you know, this isn't really a, a time to be pointing fingers because our, our own governor, you know, in her time in the House, walked out with the Democrats for the same kind of situation of a supermajority. Any response, Commissioner Cribbins? Um, I'll agree with the mayor that I don't think it's the time to be pointing fingers, and I don't think that gets us anywhere. Um, I think we need to, to look hard at what causes this culture of, um, of people thinking that they have to walk out in order to have their voice heard. And I think it's a shame that that's a point that we've reached in the Oregon legislature, because citizens deserve to have a functional legislature. And, um, and it's important that people make the effort to work across party lines to get that. Mayor Anderson, what actions do you believe the state should take to protect the health and well-being of all Oregonians and better support public health departments during the current COVID-19 pandemic and after? The uh, current COVID-19 uh, epidemic is uh, frightening, to say the least. A virus we don't know a lot about, uh, learning all the time. Um, as we learn it, certainly more about it and how it spreads, we change our uh, thoughts and uh, direction. I think the basics being the mask, the uh, washing, and the speaking is uh, appropriate. But quite frankly, you know, we've got to open up the economy. You know, um, you know there, there is, uh, I find it real difficult to understand that how we can have, uh, you know, bars open, uh, grocery stores open, um, and we can't get our kids back to school. There, there's got to be a way uh, that with uh, appropriate distancing and monitoring that we get our kids back in school and our economies function. As I mentioned earlier, I'm the liaison to Coos Health and Wellness, and I even took a little turn as incident commander of our COVID response for about 10 days um, in order to give our incident commander a break. So I'm familiar with the challenges that the counties are facing in particular with um, COVID and trying to keep everyone safe. One of the biggest frustrations has been that the state did not properly allocate CARES Act funding out to the counties. Um, we're forced to get it on a reimbursement basis. And as a county that's already struggling with financials and uh, going through this economic downturn where we were hit even harder, that was absolutely ridiculous. I've lobbied really hard for a, a fair amount of CARES Act funding for the counties because we are expected to shoulder the burden of all of the response with none of the funding and none of the ability to do any enforcement. We're told that it's our responsibility to make these rates go down so kids can go back to school. And trust me, I have a 14-year-old. I want nothing more on this earth than for him to go back to school. But yet, we're not given any of the tools. Anything further? Yes, I, I would. I, the commissioner brought up an excellent point, because um, that's one more time that the coast has been forgotten by our urban politicians. The Multnomah County got a direct fund, and then the state uh, through the legislature, governor gave them more money that should have come to not only the counties, but the cities. Because we all put forth our own budgets in uh, defense of and 
to best serve our uh, local citizens, and we haven't been reimbursed. A total change of topics. Commissioner Cribbins, do you support Oregon joining California in requiring new vehicles sold be zero emission by 2035? I think it's an admirable goal, but the technology isn't there. Um, when you live in rural Oregon, you realize that we drive a long ways, and we drive a long ways very frequently. And it hasn't been like that lately, but I can tell you about many days that I got up at 4 or 5 in the morning, drove to Salem, had meetings, turned around, and drove back. And I'm sure Mayor Anderson can tell the same kind of stories, because that's part of what it's like when you live in rural Oregon. Um, frankly, once the technology gets there and we are able to have um, zero emission vehicles that allow us to do the amount of traveling that we need to do, I'm sure they will be far more widely adopted. But we also need to deal with the prices because we have many, many citizens that are looking for a vehicle that costs around $1,000. And as far as I know, there are no electric vehicles yet that meet that criteria. So we need to, to make sure we're not leaving people behind and leaving people where they don't have another choice. And I, I hate to make this so easy, but I happen to agree with the commissioner uh, 100%. And uh, again, so many of these uh, thoughts and policies uh, are made in urban areas and are urban-centric. And, and that's uh, the problem we have in rural Oregon and on the coast. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time in our cars because we don't have an alternative. And, you know, once you know, we decide as a state to support public transportation in the rural areas, spend the money, give us uh, on the coast some alternatives, then something other than gas burning vehicles and cars, you know, could be an option. Anything further, Commissioner? Um, I will say if there's any positive side to COVID, it's that a lot of areas that were in non-attainment before for air quality standards, have actually attained um, good air. And so we know that there's opportunities. We know that people can testify by phone or by internet, and we should not lose those opportunities when the pandemic is over. Mayor Anderson, what is your position on the issue of emphasizing treatment as opposed to punishment for the mentally ill or substance addicted persons convicted of crimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of certainly treatment, um, but uh, one of the things that I've found and uh, my uh, counselors and police officers help people uh, convince me of is that a person has to be wanted to, to, to be helped in order to follow through. So um, it's a nice uh, overture. I think we you know, certainly need to be aware of and have available all the uh, necessary um, facilities and treatments that are possible. Um, but you know, there's got to be motive behind uh, an individual to take treatment and stay with the treatment. So I, I want to I give it everything I can first and foremost, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think you have to have that enforcement capability as well. The mayor and I agree on this one also. Um, you know, that's the thing is, I worked in the child welfare system as an attorney um, for a while in my career. And if taking people's children away is not enough incentive for them to get off drugs, then I don't know what is. But it's still not enough for some people. And so I know that they wouldn't just get clean on their own. And I have seen people turn their lives around get their children back, and get their self-respect back again. Um, drugs do horrible things to people, and it takes away everything that they have. Um, I, I want to keep every tool we have in our toolbox for helping people get clean, because it's really not any way for a human to live. Anything? I'm, I'm good, I agree. All right. Mr. Cribbins, would you support the creation of an independent commission 
consisting of 12 persons selected after a screening process and excluding legislators and other public officials to draw up the redistricting plan for Oregon. So the census has been an interesting process, as many people know. Um, I have been actively involved in the whole census thing for several years because we've been very concerned about getting enough people counted. Um, I think an independent board is a good idea. Um, I hate to see the whole process politicized of how these lines are drawn. Um, I really, for me, I just hope that we got as many people counted as possible because it's critical for our future and for how services are allocated. Um, and I'm really, I'm really concerned about the way that the census was held this year. Thanks. And I too uh, would, would agree. I'm not at all uncomfortable with uh, independent uh, commission. I, I'm, I don't know if the number makes a, a difference or not, uh, 12 versus 20. Uh, who knows? But I think that the key again is to getting the politics out of uh, such a redistricting. And uh, like the commissioner, I, I too am concerned that uh, we haven't counted all the people uh, that are out there in our current Senate district in our state under the census. Anything further, Commissioner? I hope you all completed your census forms. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> all right, only a couple more to go. Commissioner, or Mayor Anderson, what is the most important issue, in your opinion, facing our state today? For me, the most important issue is getting our economy back on track. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, this economy in Oregon was uh, rocking and rolling as a state. Um, it was not on the coast. You know, we've really not uh, recovered from the recession. Um, but we've got to get that economy going. We're in, um, our revenue is generated by uh, income tax. And you know, you've got to have your employees working being paid, paying their taxes, in order for us as a state to take care of the, the things that are needed and prioritize. Ready for me? Um, the most important issue to me is recovery from COVID and the wildfires. I think we can all agree that 2020 has been a year that we don't want to repeat anytime soon. And it's really exacerbated a lot of the issues that we already had in our communities. Poverty, homelessness, um, mental health issues, addiction issues, and it's really spotlighted those things and the fact that we really need to be addressing them because those issues are going to come to us whether we want to deal with them or not. On the plus side, I think it's shown us opportunities. Um, it's emphasized our need to improve our infrastructure and to improve broadband. Um, I think many people have discovered that it's um, that our broadband system currently is inadequate. We know that it, we need broadband for telehealth and for schools and for working from home. So to me, those are the priorities that we need to look at as we come out of out of 2020. Anything and the, the only thing I would would remind us all is those things that the commissioner talked about are, are certainly important, but they all take money and. Uh, you know, with the budget that's uh, planned, our revenue shortfalls these next four or six years, you, you'd need to get your economy back in place in order to generate the revenue, the dollars, in order to do those things. So, thank you. Commissioner Cribbins, has your position regarding the Jordan Cove Energy Project changed since you became a candidate? What are your reasons for taking your position? Yeah. Unfortunately, as a county commissioner who still has land use responsibility for the Jordan Cove project, I've never been able to take a public position on it because I've taken many, many land use votes. And I believe we actually have seven current land use permits um, on the Jordan Cove project. Every time that one of the commissioners does take a public position, we end up um, going up on appeal and it costs the taxpayers a lot of money in attorney fees. 
And so um, I haven't taken a public position. What I will say is I think there are some really important um, considerations and values that we need to have when we talk about Jordan Cove. We need to remember that the South Coast desperately needs jobs and needs to improve its economy. Um, we need to remember that public property rights are important. And those, to me, are the things that I weigh when I'm thinking about projects like the Jordan Cove project. And I would also say that, um, that we really need to think about, you know, the Jordan Cove project is really polarizing for people, and we need to talk about if not that, then what? Thanks. Mayor Anderson. Yes, I, I have taken a position on Jordan Cove, and that was uh, early and, and often um, in, in support of the project. Uh, as I've stated, we need living wage jobs on the coast. We need to diversify our economy on the coast. And uh, I think Jordan Cove, through the process, has to uh, meet all the process steps along the way. And um, I, I, too, agree that um, the property rights issue for those who have the pipeline across need to be taken care of. In the end, even for the environmentalists, uh, the product that would be exported would greatly uh, attribute to a reduction in carbon on a global level. Because anytime we can do away with a coal-burning electrical plant, the globe would be a lot better off. Thank you. Anything further, Commissioner? No, thank you. All right, the last, the last question. Mayor, do you see any conflicts with allowing candidates with multiple endorsements from different parties? Interestingly, interesting question. Um, no. I, I don't. Um, uh, I think anybody should, any party, any group of people should have the right to put forth their candidate for a position. Um, if, if, if the candidate meets enough of the criterias, criterias and, and you know, that group wants to uh, support them, I, I think that's very appropriate. and. Uh, you know, especially in a general election where everybody is, is voting, um, very appropriate. Commissioner Gribbins? I don't see any reason why it's a problem. Um, I think, you know, for many people, a party affiliation is a shorthand way of knowing the values that a candidate stands for. Um, for those of us that are moderate, that are from the coast, that are used to working in the world of being nonpartisan, I think it's probably not as clear cut as it is in other areas. Um, I like to tell everybody that I am you know, ruthlessly pragmatic and you know, that's kind of the political party that I come from. Um, but I, I think those of us that grew up here and those of us that have been in this world for a while realize that we are fiercely independent down here and we do what we believe is right for our citizens um, regardless of our political party. You know, my only uh, comment back would, would be a, a disappointment um, in how um, the voting public seems to want to paint uh, whatever card you're carrying, uh, the individual, with uh, a broad brush for a, a candidate and that uh, they all look the same. And as the commissioner said, uh, a lot of us uh, moderates, you know, have, have found difficulty in either party or all parties. Uh, maybe we, we've got to form our own and call it just moderates. Uh, so I, I would hope the voter really does look through the party, whatever they're endorsed by, and look at the individual. And we're now to closing statements. Each candidate will have two minutes for closing remarks, um, including to clarify and summarize their positions and goals. And we will be starting with Mayor Anderson. Thank you. Um, politicians often uh, talk a lot and say things like, I will do. I'd like to leave you with a few things that I've actually accomplished as uh, mayor of Lincoln City, so you can imagine what can be done for the coast as I'm elected Senate. I built a new hospital with no new taxes for citizens. 
brought educational scholarships to business owners to further their skills in running their business, partnered to create needed childcare by building the Early Learning Center, initiated relationships to break a 12-year standoff with ODOT and completed several road and safety projects. Completed a new police station using mainly tourist dollars through the transit uh, room tax. Joined a dysfunctional city council and helped to create a cohesive work environment. Headed a water conservation efficiency project for the city, saving water and saving taxpayers numerous dollars. I have the experience and creative thinking skills. I can get the job done. It's time to start working together as a functional unit. I'm ready to be your state senator and would be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Commissioner Cribbins. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you and with the League of Women Voters in particular. Um, it almost makes things feel like normal which I know you guys are as anxious as I am for things to get back to normal. And I hope that the next time we do this, it will be in person with an audience. Um, I am Melissa Cribbins. I grew up here on the coast, um, right in Coquille, right around the corner from the courthouse. And I've had the distinct honor of being your county commissioner for the last eight years. I appreciate the trust that you've put in me to do that work. And I believe that I have done it well and I have done it in a way that represents you. I have a track record of standing up for my constituents against special interest and against the wishes of my own party. And I will do exactly the same in Salem. I'm not running for state senate to make friends with other politicians or to play politics. I'm running to represent you and do what's right for the coast. I am proud of the broad array of support that I have for my campaign from the State Police Officers Association to the Nurses Association, and from community members and elected officials across the political spectrum. And that's because I've spent my whole career working to build those relationships and to let people know that I am a truly independent voice who does what's right for her community and for her citizens. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this debate tonight, and I hope that I have earned your vote. Thank you. And thank you both for your willingness to participate.